Today's lunch talk will be given by Marguerite Belpichi, who is um, a national award-winning newspaper woman. She's a freelance writer, magazine, and book editor. Um, she's covered stories for the New York Times Magazine, which I read every Sunday, um, and the National Geographic. Um, she's won a Pulitzer uh, for the coverage of school desegregation um, in an article in the Boston Globe. I could go on and on, but I'm not because I want to hear from Marguerite. So we look forward to your Hi, everybody. I, I, I hope you're not put off by me interrupting all of your conversations. I didn't win the Pulitzer. I just submitted articles to a, uh, I submitted articles to the submission that won the Pulitzer for the staff of the Boston Globe. Um, so I'm hoping that my prepared remarks today, as we all return to our daily lives and day jobs, will add something to the conversation about women in science, particularly contribute to a deeper understanding. Before diving in, I'd like to share a little something about my personal experience writing this piece. I've written a lot of articles about a lot of things that conjured up emotions, murder, suicides, you know, the danger and desperation of, of what life is like in Contra Camp in Honduras, uh, holding a father's hand after his father died, after his daughter died when he couldn't find her a liver. Uh, but somehow nothing ever hit home quite as directly as reporting this story. And I find that I'm still processing what I learned. I feel as if I went through a ringer personally and that my own consciousness as a woman was raised. And in some respects, the experience was agonizing. So I'll be talking about that and how I got the assignment and what my research process was like. And of course, uh, as promised, the hidden forces behind why there's still so relatively few women in science and what difference it, it makes. Uh, it's a huge topic and I entered into it uh, completely unprepared. Not only am I not an academic or a scientist, I'm not even a science writer. I didn't propose the topic, uh, nor did I have a particular interest in it journalistically before I got the call. I've always been a generalist. I guess because it seems to lead me down more interesting paths, but it's also just what I do. So I come to you today humbly as an outsider. Uh, the way this particular story came about is that back in July, uh, Pause One ran an article about a big survey that was conducted among young people working in the field, uh, and it reported extensive sexual harassment and even assault, uh, usually involving young women, but also some young men, and at the outset of their career, some of you may have come across it or heard about it. So the editors uh, at the Geographic were coming up with ideas for their online news magazine and they thought it would be a good jumping off point not to write about these sexual harassment reports or even why there aren't more women in science, but what difference does it make? Um, so an editor called me up, I'm a freelancer, and said, you want to do it? And I said, yes. So as I said, this is a huge topic. I had no background in it, no contacts. And I was immediately stricken with dread uh, because it's always like this. I'm always operating outside of my comfort zone. Um, I've been practicing the martial art of Aikido for almost 20 years, and there's a, there's a word used to describe an approach to that discipline in life in general. It's called Shoshin, which means beginner's mind. You know, adopting a neutral frame of mind, not having preconceptions or prejudgment, neither believing nor disbelieving, but remaining open-minded, which, as I understand it, used to be what a skeptic was. Um, I found that by reminding myself at the start that I don't really know anything uh, puts me in a properly unassuming frame of mind and it, it frees me up to ask simple, naive questions of people who are experts that can lead to insights that somebody more seasoned might miss. So I get this assignment on a topic I know nothing about and I'm poking around um, Google just enough to get started. And over a few weeks or a month, I interview a bunch of people, chosen mainly intuitively by following my nose. There were a couple of science historians, an expert on diversity, more on gender, a couple of psychologists, professors. They were from Stanford, Cornell, the University of Michigan, Rice, San Francisco State, uh, someone at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, someone at the National Science Foundation, uh, Women's Health Research Institute at Northwestern, and even the head of Norway's Committee on Gender Balance in Research. So I talked to all these people, and it isn't long before my head is swimming with an excruciating confusion of information, and the more confused I get, the more people I talk to, and it just keeps getting worse, more complicated, layered, 
and hidden. It wasn't adding up at this point in history with all the progress women have made, and of course there's been tremendous progress, it wasn't adding up that more of them weren't just not in science, but leading the field. Women now make up half the national workforce. They earn more college and graduate degrees than men, and by some estimates, they represent the largest single economic force in the world. But the gender gap persists. According to the National Science Foundation, we're producing in the biomed area, you probably all know this more, PhDs who are women than men, but if you look at the number lost from every rank by the time you get to full professor, women are still behind the eight ball. And in the STEM research, in STEM workforce as a whole, they appear to have reached a plateau. Just a few more statistics and I'm done with that. According to the U.S. Census Bureau in 1970, women working in STEM fields made up 7% of that workforce. By 1990, the figure had jumped to 23%. But the rise seemed to have stopped there. Uh, two decades later, in 2011, women made up 26% of the science workforce. So however you slice it, however it's happening and putting aside blame, at the end of the day, women are not staking out a proportional share of and especially leading in fields related to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, particularly computer science and engineering. It, it may be easy and it's certainly tempting to just blame the men. But it's not fair and it's counterproductive and there's so much more to it than that. So at this point, it's not as if you know, women aren't wanted, at least theoretically. As I understand it, a lot of money and effort have been spent and continue to be spent by government, private institutions, corporations, trying to draw girls and women into science and as workers and keeping them there, but the gender gap persists. At some point, I found myself at a total loss for any kind of organizing principle of how to even think about why this was happening. I, I felt like uh, somebody wasn't telling me something. Then I remembered Alan Greenspan. Um, back in the 1970s, I was a young reporter for the Boston Globe and decided I wanted to write a story about money for the paper Sunday magazine. I had realized I didn't understand it at all. I didn't know what money even was. I'm like 27 years old. So I got a hold of a phone number uh, for Alan Greenspan somehow. He wasn't head of the Fed at the time, but he was something. And I called him up and he actually picked up the phone. And we just started talking about money. And I said, I want to know what was behind it. I said, there's no gold standard. There's no silver standard. What's backing it up? What's keeping it in place? And there's this long pause and he says, an idea. I said, that's it? An idea? There's another long pause and he said, uh, belief. Belief in capitalism and how it works. Belief in the American way of life. So then it hit me. What exactly is behind there not being more women in science? It's obvious, really, it's so simple that it's almost confusing. What's behind it is an idea. That was my humble, simple insight. What's behind it and why it persists has to do with how and what we all think and believe about men and women as a society and as a people. And the amount of change we get, I think, will be directly proportional to how much women and men can change the way they think about each other and about themselves. I'll get into it more specifically later, but in the most general sense, it has something to do with how we're all conditioned by the features of our culture, you know, by the entrenched beliefs and traditions we're born into and brought up to accept without anybody really talking about it. The way our parents were before us and their parents before them, it's like turtles all the way down. So we all buy into it on some level and we become <coughs> complicit in it, all of us to one degree or another, uh, because that's what's already there when we come into being. It's the cultural medium that we're swimming through. It's like a computer program running silently in the background. Uh, Sue Rosser, who's the provost of San Francisco State University, put it so perfectly simply when I asked her why she thought the path to gender equality, even, un even coming to an understanding of what that means, has to be so messy and slow, because it's not rational, she said. It involves a lot of unconscious, subtle stuff that's going on all the time, just, be, just beneath the level of our awareness. And you probably all realize this, but how many women have been misdiagnosed in emergency rooms and sent home only to die at some point later on because we didn't know them what we know now, that women exhibit different symptoms for heart disease than men? How many women suffer more from the side effects of certain drugs, statins to sleep meds, because we didn't discover what the side effects, side effects would be until the drugs were already on the market. And those are just the obvious outcomes that we all know of. As you all probably know, I had forgotten, it took an act of Congress, an act of Congress, to get more women included in clinical trials. That was 1993. Why weren't they included previously? 
I don't think a bunch of people got around and said, we have to keep women out. I may be wrong, but I don't think that was the case. I don't think it was uh, deliberate. It was worse. It was unconscious. The research variables that would have led to more complete and subtle scientific knowledge just didn't occur to whoever was doing the scientific inquiry. As a result, sex, a big variable, one would think, was not taken into account the same way as variables like time, temperature, and dose, even in diseases thought of as female diseases. So there was this blind spot. And the blind spot was that the basic model in research, the model that's been used to design drugs and products for all of us, the standard reference in Gray's Anatomy, has historically been predicated on the physiology of the average size male, as if that model were gender neutral. That just floored me. Even the rats and other animals used in scientific experiments, the cells and tissues have mainly been male, based on an assumption that the male could reliably predict all human experience. That was another thing that floored me. Just because, and I know nothing about scientific research, but just because on the face of it, it didn't seem to make common sense. And when I would ask people why things were done this way, what I learned was that it was just the way things had always been done. It was the cultural medium that we were all swimming through, like since the olden times. There were just ingrained traditions in basic scientific research, procedural biases that were so routine as to be for the longest time invisible. Or maybe by the time they started realizing it, you know, people, they didn't know what they didn't know. So, and maybe by the time they started realizing it, they were invested for a variety of sometimes good scientific reasons in things the way they were, or nobody spoke up, or if somebody did speak up, it didn't go anywhere. As you probably know, the National Institutes of Health just this year announced that from now on, NIH, sci NIH scientists are going to have to use sex and gender variables in their experiments, as well as female lab animals and tissues and cells. And a number of people have said to me, Wait, weren't we like already doing that? So okay, next realization, I'm bumbling along on my little story. I'm thinking about the nature of the relationship between the sexes as it relates to science. It's not long before I make another obvious leap, which is that what's happening with women in science is happening to one degree or another with women in general, across the professions and around the world, particularly when it comes to women as leaders. In science, as I understand it, Women are well represented in the social sciences, biological sciences, psychology, medicine, but even in these fields, they're not nearly equivalently represented as leaders. And that seems to be the case pretty much across the board. Women in science and business, politics, law, you can't separate it out. <clears throat> when I was preparing for today, I came across the website for a self-described independent nonpartisan educational institute called the Center for American Progress. They had a page on women it reported that there was tremendous advancement in the last decades of the 20th century, but that women then didn't move into positions of prominence and power anywhere near what you might expect to follow that flooding into the field. Their presence, this I'm quoting, their presence in top leadership positions as equity law partners, medical school deans, corporate executive officers remains stuck at a mere 10 to 20 percent. Their share of voice on op-ed pages and corporate boards as TV pundits in Congress is just 15%. In fact, it's now estimated that at the current rate of change, it will take until 2085 for women to reach parity with men. 2085. Apparently, aside from what does seem to be an increasing number of high-profile exceptions, a female leader is still something of an exotic on par with Monet Davis pitching a shutout in the Little League World Series. So OK, I keep asking myself, why are things like this? I'm asking everyone I talk to, I'm collecting all the possible reasons why, even though that's not my assignment, uh, because I can't help myself. And they're all tangled together, and the main culprit being, you know, gender bias in all its many forms. So I'm going to lay some of that out. You've heard some of it today. I'm going to repeat it for strategic redundancy, as my husband, who's a management consultant, would put it. So uh, there are research laboratories and university departments run mainly by older men from bygone eras who may create accidentally, unconsciously, or by design what are often referred to as chilly climates for women. I'm not saying this is the general rule. I'm just saying they're still out there. Uh, someone said to me, we make progress with every retirement. But, <laughs> but these practices vary widely. And I'm told it's also true that many men are and have been wonderful mentors to women and champions of women. Uh, there's the effect, of course, of harassment and sometimes assault, as reported in the Plaza One article that generated this assignment. 
for National Geographic. And these are the same behaviors that are under scrutiny on college campuses, in the military, and elsewhere in our society. Uh, women may also not be as interested in, in certain high-end fields and the insanely demanding hours and psychic energy they demand. So there's the important factor of personal choice. If you look at the internet, half or more internet users are women, and women are known to be early and enthusiastic adopters of most technologies. Yet computer science is the field with the lowest participation by women, engineering second. The number of women receiving bachelor's degrees in computer science related computer science related bachelor degrees has actually declined to below 20%. Why might that be? For one thing, the image in computer science is of this bro coding Silicon Valley culture in which you're expected to be working even when you're not working. I don't know if, uh, how accurate that is, but that's the generic image. So what's that workplace going to be like? If you're a woman and you're considering a field like computer science that seems to be mainly populated by men, you figure you're gonna be the only woman there or one of a few. And the work involves these insane hours where you're sitting in a room all day coding. So a woman might not be so attracted to that, even if that's where the money is and the demand for workers is, uh, especially if she thinks she might want to have a family someday. And also, especially, if she has other options, you know, like medicine or law. Other factors. Girls are being, of course, socialized from early on and advised in ways subtly and not so subtly that, uh, you know, steer them elsewhere despite many efforts to change that. Girls being socially conditioned not to compete particularly with boys. I remember my mother telling me when I was a child, this would be uh, back in the late 50s, and of course she loved me very much and wanted to protect me. But she was also a woman very much of her time. And I remember her saying to me, Marguerite, don't beat the boys at their games. Because I was an athletic little girl, and I could and I did. They won't like you. There's also evidence that women tend to unconsciously undervalue themselves and other women and overvalue men. They demonstrate less confidence than male colleagues of equal or lesser skill who happen to have greater swagger, and they are disliked for their accomplishments and abilities. And there continues to be conscious and unconscious gender bias, of course, in recruitment, hiring, and promotion. Letters of recommendation being written differently, men being preferred over women, offered more money, more likely to be mentored, even when their credentials are identical. So an interesting aspect of this, and a very delicate aspect of this, is that these biases against women in recruitment, hiring, and promotion are being, evidently being practiced um, at the same rates by women as by their male colleagues. And this has been shown to be the case in social science literature going back to the 1990s. I remember another time when I was a little girl in the same neighborhood, and I'm eight years old, and I beat a boy in a foot race. Anyway, afterwards, the boy, the only way to describe him is that he was stricken. And so another boy comes up to him and puts an arm around his shoulder and says, don't worry, she's just a girl. <laughs> I don't remember very much from my childhood, uh, but I remember that. And, and, I, and it really wasn't until I started doing this story that I, I think I realized why it made such an impression. It was the first time I was being explicitly informed of what my place was, that I wasn't going to matter, and also that it probably wouldn't be expected of me to matter. So I was being dismissed in one fell swoop, and in some subtler way, I was also being let off the hook. Anyway, I shared that story with a program director at the National Science Foundation, and she said to me, now imagine that it's today, and you beat that boy in a race, and the person coming up to put an arm around the stricken boy is a girl. I almost wanted to clutch my chest when she said that, and I'm not sure why. She certainly didn't mean it as an indictment, so much, I think, is an example of how insidious and self-defeating some of these behaviors can be. And on top of that, these gender biases in hiring and promotion, as described to me, have increasingly gone underground because people know now they have to be careful what they say. Uh, you know, they could be publicly embarrassed or even lose their jobs. And I'm not talking about everyone or even most people necessarily, and it varies from place to place. Some people realize they're doing it, some don't. But, you know, it can happen that they make sure there's a woman and an African-American on the search committee and they check all the right boxes. But in their heart of hearts, you know, they're not really on board. Not necessarily because they're bad people, but because they're used to doing things the way they've always been done and they believe in it. You know, they know how to pick them and they know how to promote them. Uh, and the biases are traditional and routine, like only experimenting with male rats in the lab. Perhaps the... Uh, uh, the biggest issue of all and the trickiest to resolve, of course, has to do with the differing biological realities 
of men and women be because of, I think, where we are as a society and how jobs are structured. Having a family tends to have a much more negative effect on the career of a woman, obviously, whose prime childbearing years often coincide with when she may be most likely to make leaps up. And having a child is not a discrete event. It's not like you leave, you have your baby, and you come back, and everything's the way it was. It changes your life. From that point on, everything is different. And you know, certainly more men, and particularly the young men, are increasingly involved in their children's lives, and more of them may even be dusting, vacuuming, and cooking. But women are still taking on the lion's share of those duties, even when both spouses work full time. And as I understand it, a, a significant percentage of female scientists are married to male scientists. So for a woman, having a baby can sap that career drive, certainly complicates re-entry into the career path, and especially in fields like engineering and computer science, again, fields with the lowest participation by women, which as I understand it are very fast moving fields, so that if you leave, you can lose a lot of professional ground very quickly. I'm told there's a code question for finding out when interviewing a female applicant uh, if she plans to have children, because you know you can't ask directly. The code question is what are your plans for the future? Leaving her in an absolutely impossible position. There's also a term I heard about apparently being used among women who are on a tenure track, um, which as you know is unusually punishing and protracted. They talk about having their tenure baby, meaning delaying parenthood until after they get it. So more and more institutions and uh, universities are offering parental leaves to men and women and flex schedules and everything to contribute to you know, life and work balance. But depending on where you are, there's still a stigma attached. You know, there could be a stigma attached, maybe not at MIT, but if you take advantage of them because, and fewer than might take advantage of them are taking advantage of them because there's a fear that it will raise the question of how serious are you about science? So coming to terms with issues related to parenthood, perhaps more than anything else, making that a priority as a society, it just seems from you know, my kind of broad research, an obvious thing could go a long way to attracting more women to science and keeping them there and allowing them to naturally rise to positions of leadership. You know, widespread quality childcare, workable career exit and exit and end re-entry strategies on and off ramps, somebody called them. So is there a way to properly care for our children without being so stressed out and capable women having to risk sacrificing their careers? You know, I don't know. So, you know, as I was looking into all this, I, I can't say that any one thing stood out as so revelatory. It was only after I put it all together and typed it all up and read the material over and over that I could appreciate how many factors were in play. You know, together they amounted to what's been described to me as an accumulation of disadvantage. The long history of social science literature and studies about all these factors, all that data that supports everything I just said, was proof of existence. Uh, like my own feelings about my own experiences, I wasn't making it up. It wasn't just a story. And I've always thought of myself as a pretty aware person, but I never realized, the ex really, the extent to which I was being affected by all these forces just because I'm a woman. I started wondering if and how I might even have been complicit in holding myself back. At times I felt really mixed up and uh, miserable, and like I, like I was a grain of sand sloshing around inside an oyster. And there was this gnawing friction that I instinctively wanted to escape. Sometimes I couldn't sleep. Memories I had forgotten flooded back. And there were waves of emotion, anxiety, embarrassment, shame, confusion, at times a boiling rage. My poor dear husband. So for most of this process, I felt little like I was trapped in a cave and my eyes kept trying to adjust to the lack of light. I was still asking myself, why has it been so difficult to get near equal representation of women and men in STEM. I know I just named all these possible reasons, but what could be the reason behind the reasons? I talked with this about a guy named James Gross. He's a psychologist at Stanford who studies emotion and the regulation of emotion. And our conversation really stuck with me. You know, there may be many answers, but they all seem to start with the simple idea uh, that I touched on earlier, that there's something about the culture we live in that's, that's, uh, that we're operating in that pushes women in one direction and it pushes men in another direction. The context we're born into, the families, the communities, they all represent ideas and practices and beliefs that we absorb pretty much through osmosis while we're not paying attention. When I say we, of course, I'm talking about men and women, boys and girls alike, and you know, because the men are trapped too. Women are conditioned to maintain stability in the home and keep everybody happy. You know, women are the stasis keepers. Men are conditioned to make their mark on the world, take charge, be strong, solve problems. 
women aren't conditioned to lead along with the men but support them in doing so. We know all this. Uh, for men, and particularly white men, it has happened to be the case that they're steered in ways that hugely benefited them as a group, economically, and in terms of having a disproportionate amount of power and prestige and influence over the direction of Western civilization. But those directions weren't necessarily good for them as individuals. Uh, I mean, we're seeing more of this today, but over the years, you know, how many women probably should have been doctors and how many men probably should have been nurses. The other thing is men don't have the same option women have to live a meaningful, a meaningful and socially acceptable life that's not centered on work and career. A capable woman who, for whatever reasons, decides that she doesn't wish to work or she can afford not to work or maybe she's frustrated in the workplace, that woman has a profound alternative. She can, she can bear life uh, and she'll be socially supported in doing that. But I don't think it's socially acceptable yet as much as times are changing uh, for a man to be a stay-at-home dad even if that suits him best. So okay, how did all this get started? Uh, how far back does it go? Well, it goes back to antiquity, specifically Aristotle and the foundation of Western civilization. So one of the things I found when I went back 2,300 years is this incredibly toxic, I think, and very powerful idea. And that idea, it's a very simple and profound idea, is that women are born inferior to men. I can feel my stomach clutch just as I say that. That seems to be the original myth on which everything was based and that everything followed. Many of you may be familiar with Aristotle's views on women. I wasn't, not really, kind of vaguely, but I certainly never put them together with what I'm talking about today. But it all seems to have started with him. He was the one who actually introduced the idea, first, that there were innate differences between the sexes, and then that not only were they innately different, but you know, women were inferior. He saw women as kind of incapacitated males with wandering wombs that caused hysteria that could only be controlled by men having sex with them a lot. So that may seem laughable today, but the thing is, because he was this great figure who had a monumental influence on shaping all of Western you know, thought, unfortunately, those ideas didn't die when he died. They kept being widely adopted you know, throughout the ages by men and women alike, long after there was ample evidence to the contrary, mainly, probably, because men were still in charge of writing the narrative, and there were no female voices in writing the narrative of human history. And we can see those ideas are still you know, very much alive today in varying degrees around the world. Women can't do this, they can't do that, they can't work, they're not as smart, they're manipulative, they need to be protected. So Aristotle's ideas were the original organizing narrative around what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And to one degree or another, I think we may still be telling ourselves that story. What else? other than entrenched, unconscious thinking formulated 2,300 years ago could even begin to explain why it had to take an act of Congress to get more women involved in clinical trials, that it had to take until this year, and the NIH had to make it an official requirement for sex and gender to be included as variables in scientific research this year, to begin the process of dismantling the idea in science that the male could reliably predict all of human experience. So okay, it is what it is. As for women in science, and there not being more of them, what difference does it make? I don't think it's so much about what difference it makes to women, though that, of course, is important in its own right. It's not about, oh, you poor woman, as one science historian put it. It's about the difference it makes to all of us, you know, for society. And, and that, in turn, is part of a larger com conversation about the value of diversity. The population of the United States is growing more diverse uh, every year, uh, and at an accelerating rate. And now it's looking like diversity is actually starting to make uh, market sense. Because businesses are recognizing that if they want to grow or even stay alive, they're going to have to figure out how to understand and satisfy this increasingly diverse customer base. Uh, I learned a lot of this from an article I came across in something called the Deloitte Review, which is a journal for business leaders I'd never heard of. But in any event, today the, uh, you know, the best leaders and the best companies are looking to create inclusive workplaces in which diversity is seen as an asset where you're not fighting it anymore, you're not suspicious of it, you're not tolerating it. You actually see this as this really good, exciting thing and a solution to increasingly complex world problems and you're trying to make it work. Because it's thought that that workplace that reflects the wide range of cultural backgrounds and experience and ways of looking at things is thought to be more likely to come up with ideas and solutions that other people who don't have diverse teams uh, will come up with. So as for how women fit into this picture, the Atlantic Monthly reported this year 
Half a dozen global studies conducted by the likes of Goldman Sachs and Columbia University have found that companies employing women in large numbers outperform their competitors on every measure of profitability. So common sense would dictate that not fully tapping from half the population puts our society at disadvantage. And at a time when science and technology are transforming our world with a, an alarming scope and speed, and when the United States is kind of scrambling to keep pace. And this applies to the exclusion of qualified members of any underrepresented group, gay people, African-American people, Latino people, people with different physical abilities, whose, whose perspectives, the diversity of those perspectives and those insights into the nature of reality, in addition to their added intelligence and creativity, could be indispensable to solving 21st century problems. And what we think of as science problems affect everyone children, women, and men of all backgrounds. What science decides to solve and for whom things are designed has a lot to do with who's at the table, who's doing the scientific inquiry. Will there be more push to develop drugs for male pattern baldness or for a better seatbelt so that a pregnant woman and her fetus won't be injured or even killed in a car crash? Uh, another thing that has implications for the potential role of women is the way in which scientific research is now conducted. The tradition of solo geniuses making discoveries all on their own uh, if that was ever strictly true, you know, has given way to research done by teams, something you probably all know I didn't before doing this story. Collaboration, <laughs> including interdisciplinary collaboration, is now the foundation of STEM research. And when you're talking about teams, automatically you're thinking, what makes the best team? There's a guy at the University of Michigan, Scott Page, who studies diversity in complex systems. And as he explained it to me, ideally what you want on these teams in terms of scientific knowledge and life experience is range. If you've got a group composed, say, of the five highest math performing people available, a sixth one doesn't really help you. Uh, all the people on the team need to meet a certain threshold of skill and knowledge to be able to perform. But he said what's been discovered at uh, Michigan is that once that threshold is met, uh, then adding people to the team just because they exceed that threshold really doesn't add value. What does add value is having a broad set of tools to draw on skills, analogies, tricks, a multifaceted intelligence that exceeds the sum of its parts. Ideally, you want smart, qualified people from different cultural and educational backgrounds, including but not limited to women, as having that kind of mix stands to increase the probability for true innovation, <coughs> for developing better techniques and better questions. It's about adding to the methodologies that already exist and expanding on the knowledge that all, that's already there and not missing a variable. You know, women have been involved in the invention of, among many other things, and against all odds, the circular saw, Neistat, and Kevlar, many other things. They also invented disposable diapers, the dishwasher, folding cribs, because, hey, that's where they spent a lot of their time. Either men or women are maybe capable of inventing any of those things, but women in the mix increases the range of possibility simply because of what they bring based on how they're living their lives differently from men. One gender studies professor talked to me about what's happening in engineering and the development of uh, smart houses. She says, uh, you get your heat connected and lights turned on and alarm systems set, they're all about control. It's not like what a woman might want or be more likely to think of, like can we invent something where the house cleans itself? <laughs> and for whatever reason, you know, another value women add, probably because women are raised to be more socially aware and more socially responsible than men, is greater emotional intelligence, wherever they are. Uh, based on what I was told by people who study and know about these things, there's a lot of overlap uh, between men and women in terms of traits and intelligence and emotional traits because of their shared human experience. But as a rule, no surprise, women do tend to exhibit more communal qualities like fostering good relations, to build community, creating an inclusive environment where individuals can do their best. And men tend to exhibit more agency, you know, the willingness to assume leadership, ambition for individual achievement, making things happen. You know, there are some very agenic women, that was a new word for me, and some very communal men, and most people fall somewhere in between. You know, the point is what might be gained by having the entire range of emotional skills in any mix on these teams, particularly when it comes to leadership. He said, you know, we don't want to just have more talented women joining talented men. We want to make sure that women with well-developed skills don't end up one way or another, and you know it happens all the time, stuck at lower levels working in labs when perhaps they could have been directing the field. So real change is always uh, personal. Uh, when and how it happens is unique within all of us, I think, one heart and mind at a time. When a woman drops out of sciences, 
to uh, raise a family, how much of that is a decision based on her and her husband's individual values? How much is based on societal pressures and traditional expectations? How much from the frustration of encountering what, feel like, what feels like too many barriers in her way? At the same time, how many of us have had the courage or wherewithal to speak out or to examine our own behaviors and change our own beliefs about ourselves? I don't know, I doubt that I have. Uh, we have to change what we believe and first we have to know what we believe. At this stage of the game, when it comes to women in science, what seems to be needed is not more lip service or tokenism, not quotas, not checking boxes. What's needed is buy-in, followed by genuine acceptance, which may sound like a pie-in-the-sky goal, but maybe on the big stage. But one place they appear to have pulled it off is at the University of Michigan. They did it through an institutional consciousness-raising program that was funded by the National Science Foundation. It's called STRIDE. Suffice it to say that this involved engineers, biologists, physicists, actually discussing among themselves and at a deep level the extensive social science and cognitive science research literature, you know, like they were outside of their disciplines. And they studied this as it related to the sorts of subtle systemic gender biases in recruiting, hiring, and promoting that culminate in time over, in time, uh, and culminate in smaller salaries and slower rates of promotion for women. They then used the information to identify the biases and fix them. And the result was that Michigan schools of science and engineering increased the proportion of well-qualified women hired by 30% every year for nine years. Individuals also can make and are making differences on their own and contributions. Uh, James Gross, the psychologist I spoke about, he started a new professional society with a colleague at Northeastern. And they've made it a requirement that half of the women making presentations at their programs that half of the presenters of the programs be women, pretty much no matter what it takes. Uh, he has a daughter, she's 13 and she loves math and science. And he says it hasn't occurred to her yet that that's unusual, but he knows that it will. Uh, she's already being pulled out of class to do advanced things with a couple of other kids who are guys. And as someone who studies human emotion for a profession, he knows that as time goes on, she's going to be increasingly, she's gonna feel increasingly lonely as a girl who's interested in math and science. So he's doing what he can to keep her uh, open to all of her talents. In the meantime, he, he has this vision. It's of a world where talented girls and boys feel free to pursue lives historically perceived as not appropriate to their gender for the simple reason that it's better for them, he says, and it's better for society. Thank you so much. So of the three world religions, it's clearly a bias against women. They're not considered equal. And don't you think that's perpetuated a lot of the time? Well, you're just adding to, you know, basically what I said. I was speaking basically about Western thought, but yeah. I mean, they take the Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. They're all and I guess, I, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about what informed those religions. So... Uh, Men. Men. <laughs> they, they wrote them all, right? They're writing the narrative. Yes, thank you so much. That was wonderful. My question is about um, men and, and war, men as warriors, and um, how that is changing somewhat, but over the over centuries, uh, what role you think that may have played in, in where we are today? Men as warriors. Gee, I'm getting more and more out of my depth. You have to remember, you know, my disclaimer was that I'm a generalist. I do remember someone said to me when she was talking about engineering, you know, there's a, there's a direct relationship apparently between engineering and the military. A lot of engineering, people in engineering are men. And she said, you know, I wonder if that has something to do with all of this shoot them up, shoot them down, gaming uh, phenomenon, you know, that emerged from engineering. Um, you know, all I can... In terms of men as warriors, I'm not sure I can say anything intelligent about it. Did you have thoughts about it? Well, it's just because of wars. War being such a thread in society for cent over every century. Well, to me, it would just, I think it's because more women aren't involved. I mean, if I'm more involved, you think you're going to get my son? I have two sons. It's not going to be that easy. And, and there isn't going to be a lot of glory attached to it. So uh, the degree to which more women are just there and present just naturally changes everything. You know, someone said to me that 
speaking about you know computer science, uh, when people uh, if they're thinking about computer science, saying they're thinking, well, I'm going to be like the only woman or one of a few, it's not that attractive, and you're going to be seen as a woman, or if you're African American, or if you're Iranian, you're going to be seen as African American. You're going to be seen as that social identity. But once that number reaches a critical mass, like the number that was thrown at me was 30 percent. All of a sudden, there's like a psychological shift and it changes. You're not seen as a woman anymore. You're seen as a coworker. You're not seen as the black guy. You're seen as a coworker. You know, so yeah. I think just it's a simple thing. It, however, it can happen. More women that are involved in more things is going to improve everything because you get the whole range of skill. Men have a lot of skills. It's not about getting rid of them. It's about you know adding to what they have. So more women, better. <coughs> Two more questions. One here and one there, and then we'll have to break. Hi, I'm Jane Peterson. I'm um, CEO and president of Keystone Symposium, which is a uh, not-for-profit. And what I wanted to mention that I think you alluded to, but you um, didn't quite say specifically, is something that my father, who was a physician, um, said to me um, when I was young, because I questioned him, why, why aren't there clinical trials in women? And this is what he learned in medical school. So, uh, and it was that um, women menstruate, and that um, means that their physiology, and we know this is true, their physiology changes on a monthly cycle. And men, uh, by contrast, their physiology. So I think that that may have had quite a bit to do with this um, ban on, or this thinking that men predict women. Uh, physiology and reaction. Yeah, that women's hormones, the same with, I think, uh, the overwhelming use of male animals and male tissues and cells, yes. predicated on the idea that hormonal shifts yes. are going to skew the test results. But then when I was, after the NIH made this rule change, there's a Janine Clayton, and she runs the uh, Women's Research uh, Office uh, at NIH. And, you know, I just listened to her on the radio, and she said, you know, there, there are plenty of studies now that kind of, that's not really the case. And in fact, we're having studies that show that men, aspects of the male can skew the results. In fact, there was a, a study out of McGill earlier this year that uh, about, they were testing pain response in rats, and uh, the rats were apparently afraid of the men. It had something to do with their smell. And they became desensitized to pain, even if the women uh, researchers wore shirts that the men had worn, they became desensitized to the pain and it skewed the test results and it made everyone a little crazy because they started thinking, what could this mean for all these other studies, the reliability? So that idea was entrenched, but I think it, maybe it stopped being examined. It was accepted, even women accepted it. You know, we all accepted it and then it stopped being examined and then at a certain point in more recent history, obviously it's been re-examined again and discovered that, well, no, this isn't necessarily true. You want to include all those variables, yeah. right? Yeah. Plus, plus men also <coughs> have, have cycles as well, not the mm -hmm. same. Right. But I wonder if they take that into account. No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Last um, question. Crystal, I just have a, is this working? Yeah. That was the most extraordinary presentation. You have summarized everything you've done for 20 years. It was just. You're a Thank journalist, you. but you're the general now. It was just really, truly extraordinary. Thank but you. One, the one piece of research that you didn't mention, but you probably have read it, was that when you try to measure group intelligence, the best a predictor for group intelligence is the number of women who are in the larger team, because they actually spend time listening to one another. Right. And so they, but I want to now charge you. Because you pointed out that childcare is the essential yeah. thing. Yes. Not just that, but just, just that. How, the, how the whole society yeah. thinks it. Right. Not, and the, we think of it as motherhood, as parenthood. Somebody right. said to me, please don't call it a motherhood issue. It's a parenthood it's issue. It's a parenting right. issue. Yeah. But now I would love you to investigate what we can do in terms of really bringing childcare to this country to liberate families. Well, you know, they, they do it in the Scandinavian countries, and I think it may require being a welfare state, which I don't see happening anytime soon. But again, I think everything comes from really changing our, our beliefs about ourselves and also about what's possible. You know, it, uh, the, uh, the, the woman from MIT who said, oh, there are babies all over, and somebody made it happen. You know, you have key people can make a tremendous difference in small environments. And, um, so that's your next article. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I said, yeah, you